My name is Philippe Sands. I'm Professor of Law uh, at University College London and a barrister uh, here in London. We're here to discuss the international response to the current situation uh, in Syria. Before we start, I wonder if I could just make a few general housekeeping type announcements. Uh, the event is being held on the record. Uh, it it would be helpful if everyone could make sure that their telephones are in silent mode or preferably switched off completely. Uh, thirdly, you should be aware that the event is being live streamed. Uh, and uh, finally, let me introduce you to our speakers uh, and the order uh, in which uh, they are going to speak. Uh, to my right is Dr. James Boys, who's a visiting senior research fellow here in London uh, at King's College and also an associate professor uh, at Richmond University and is author of the book Clinton's Grand Strategy. To my immediate right and speaking second is Dr. Patricia Lewis, who is the research director on international security here at Chatham House. Uh, to my immediate uh, left is Dr. Alan George, who for the next month at least uh, is uh, the a senior associate member of St. Anthony's College, Oxford, uh, and author of the book Syria, Neither Bread Nor Freedom. Uh, and then to uh, his left, Sir Malcolm Rifkind, who's currently chairman uh, of the Intelligence and Security Committee uh, and a former uh, British Foreign Secretary. Uh, I, as chair, uh, express no views. My job is to facilitate the process. We will have half an hour of presentations, and then we will have half an hour of questions from the floor, and we will invite the questions to be uh, tight and narrowly put. I would only say this, I have just come back from a month's vacation holiday in the United States, uh, followed by four days of work in Washington. I got back this morning. Um, I signed off on Monday uh, on a long profile of a, a neighbor of mine uh, here in London who is a former intelligence uh, person. His name is David Cornwall. He writes under the name John Le Carre. Uh, the profile will appear uh, in this Saturday's Financial Time magazine. Uh, my editor on Sunday said, in light of what is happening in Syria, could you please uh, ask him for his views uh, on the situation uh, right now in Syria? Because I was in the United States and had no access to telephone, I simply sent an email, uh, and the following came back. And I read this without adopting it, but if you like to set the context of a reasonable person's view, of the current situation. If you bomb it, you own it, he wrote. He was profoundly relieved and for once proud of the House of Commons for its landmark of belated political maturity, a moment of self-recognition that Britain was not where it once was and that it was not allowing a knee-jerk accommodation, as he put it, to the wishes of our political masters. Punitive raids, he wrote, when you don't know who you are punishing and who, who you are unwittingly supporting and whether one raid will do the trick or a few more might be necessary are sheer insanity at any time, but now more than ever. Just to be clear, that is not my view. That is a view that will appear uh, on Saturday, but it sets the tone for an observer's view of the situation. Against that background, I begin by inviting James uh, to speak for a few minutes uh, on the area that he is going to lay out. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here at Chatham House. In the six minutes I have, I'd like to try and address three central points, if I may. Uh, what is the Obama administration up to? How have these events impacted US and UK relations? And what can perhaps be expected from Congress in the coming couple of days? It's understood that when John F. Kennedy was president, he uttered the uh, rather problematic expression, we have a problem making US power credible, and the place to do so is Vietnam. Clearly, Kennedy didn't live to uh, regret saying that, but I believe that President Obama has a similar problem now. On August 20th, 2012, he told Chuck Todd of NBC News, we have communicated in no uncertain terms with every player in the region, um, and there's a red line for us, and that would be enormous consequences if we start seeing movement on the chemical weapons front. I believe this cuts to the heart of a major problem with Barack Obama as president. He gets himself into a corner when he starts going off the record and ab-living. This, of course, was a statement made at the height of a presidential campaign, and one wonders whether, in retrospect, it may be seen 
I say, bigger problem in terms of rhetoric as Gerald Ford's famous slip uh, suggesting that there was no Soviet domination of Eastern Europe. Jay Carney, the press secretary, has been caught into having to do a number of uh, semantic somersaults ever since trying to get him out of that. Some of you may have seen overnight that upon arriving in Stockholm, uh, the president has now said, uh, and I quote, first of all, I didn't set a red line. Uh, some of us might uh, take issue with that. I believe that what the Obama administration is doing is comparable in many ways to what the Clinton administration did in the mid-90s when it refused to uh, endorse the idea that genocide was occurring and instead referred semantically to acts of genocide. But more on Bill Clinton very shortly. I think we've seen a semantic shift in the second Obama team. Uh, we've seen the new appointments of Samantha Power coming in and uh, Susan Rice. And I believe that what you are seeing is an interesting shift it's possible, I think, to suggest uh, that the administration has jumped into a new phase and that perhaps the advisers are now putting their agenda ahead of the president. Let me give you two very quick quotes from Samantha Power. American leaders don't act because they don't want to, and one mechanism for altering the calculus of U.S. leadership will be to make the leaders publicly or professionally accountable for their inaction. I think you can see, I think, from the statements of John Kerry and others that the advisor's rhetoric is now ahead of the president and that rhetoric is ahead of policy and that by doing so, we risk, if we're not careful, uh, green lighting and advancing U.S. Uh, uh, advances uh, to the potential enemy, allowing them to move human shield into place. Clearly, the specter of Iraq is everywhere. It's responsible for the current administration in Washington. Uh, there were clear parallels, I think, however, not with Iraq, uh, but with Bosnia in the 1990s. Then, as now, we see Western powers seeking to intervene on humanitarian grounds, uh, only to be uh, uh, blocked at the UN Security Council uh, by the, uh, the Russians. And, of course, this was something that occurred during John Major's time, uh, at a time when our esteemed uh, panel colonist uh, was Foreign Secretary. Let me speak, however, because at that point, there was a real dip, perceived at least, in UK-US uh, relations. Um, some people have talked about uh, the impact upon the special relationship, so let me turn to that briefly now. Clearly, there are challenges at the moment, but the threats to the UK-US special relationship are overstated dramatically. They make for nice headlines, uh, but they have little bearing upon reality. It's constantly written off. It has more comebacks than Sinatra. Uh, we can remember tensions, I think, before in Grenada uh, in uh, regard to Northern Ireland. Some of you might recall that the reason the White House is white is to cover the scorch marks from 1812. So I think that we can say that the relationship between the US and the UK has been worse, and there is no great problem at this time, I think. The Prime Minister has shifted UK national security apparatus to bring it in line with American thinking. And uh, one thing I think we can say is that regardless of what everyone says about the UK-US relationship, no one at this point is accusing David Cameron of being Barack Obama's poodle. What can we expect in the next couple of days as we move forward? It's remarkable, I think, that the president has turned over the running, supposedly at least, of U.S. national security uh, to, to Congress. We've seen missile strikes launched by the U.S. previously, by Reagan, by Clinton, just to name two, a Democrat and a Republican, neither of whom felt the need to uh, subordinate U.S. foreign policy uh, to Congress. It is an interesting move if there is nothing else planned except airstrikes, which obviously raises the question of what else is on the agenda. If we think about the individual houses and the Senate, you may have seen overnight that the Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, approved a, uh, a move uh, to put to the full Senate. This is being suggested as being a triumph for the Obama administration. It's important to note, however, just on that one committee alone, two Democrats opposed, one Democrat showed up and voted present, and uh, only three Republicans voted in favor. It's been suggested that if there were a vote in the House and the Senate today, neither would vote in favor. Clearly, the, uh, the vote is going to be seen in the context of the 2016 presidential election, just as Iraq was uh, and had implications for John Kerry and Hillary Clinton, both negatively. The House, of course, is strongly controlled by the Republican Party. The Democrats control the Senate, but do not have a super majority, and so could not prevent a filibuster. So anybody uh, suggesting that this is a slam dunk, uh, to use George Tenet's term, I think is overstating the fact. Congress reconvenes on Monday and will be voting upon this over the 9-11 uh, anniversary, which is of no small impact, I think. Public support for this is currently 9%, 60% overwhelmingly opposed. And by all accounts, and I quote, the word from members of the House and the Senate is that the numbers back home fail to support intervention. Calls and letters are coming in in overwhelming opposition, and the President is doing very little to change that. Just to put that in context, 47% of Americans supported intervention in Libya. 
The fundamental problem here, therefore, is we have an administration which appears disinclined to act, a Congress disinclined to act, and their White House proposals have already been rejected by the Senate already. Who would have thought, who would have thought that Ed Miliband, uh, as someone most Americans would never have heard of, would have had such a fundamental impact upon the direction of US foreign policy? Thank you. <laughs> Trisha, and I do apologise for the tight times, but we want to leave time for you to be able to ask questions. Well, first of all, I want to start by thanking you all for being here. Uh, what we're talking about really matters. And um, I think it's great that everybody's here and, and wants to engage in the issue. I'm going to talk about three things. One is why chemical weapons are different, um, why we need due process, and what the options are other than military options. So first of all, why chemical weapons are different. It's not just about mass killing. It's a horrific way to die. Loss of consciousness, convulsions, paralysis, respiratory failure. And it's also about those who do not die or do not die immediately. The suffering, the inhumanity, the nerve damage, the sight damage, breathing difficulties. And with certain other types of chemical weapons as well, sometimes passed on uh, down the generations and leading to cancers later in life depending on the, on the actual gas. Over 150 years, there have been attempts to differentiate between the very worst type of weapons, the weapons and methods of warfare of a nature to cause superfluous injury or unnecessary suffering. Such weapons are, we think, against the dictates of public conscious, consciousness. The conscience, sorry. Chemical weapons leave the injured marked for life. And we learned this 100 years ago in the First World War. Now, other weapons do as well, and there have been attempts to ban those. Some of them have been very successful attempts, dum-dum bullets, blinding lasers, anti-personnel landmines, and more recently, cluster munitions, which, by the way, have also been used in Syria, and in addition to chemical weapons, are the focus for human rights groups. Biological weapons have been banned, and they include anthrax and smallpox, and they were banned completely in 1972. And the ban on the use of chemical and bacteriological weapons was uh, far early and part of the Treaty of Versailles and became the 1925 Geneva Protocol, which prohibits the use in war of asphyxiating, poisonous or other gases, liquids, materials, justly condemned by the general opinion of the civilized world, and states that to this end, this prohibition shall be universally accepted as part of international law, binding alike the conscience and practice of nations. These things matter. These laws were adopted because of horrific experiences. When Iraq used them against Iran in the 1980-88 war, few spoke out against Saddam Hussein for doing so, and that was a mistake. When he used them against the Kurds in a month-long attack as part of the Anfal campaign, culminating in the atrocity of thousands dead at Halabja, again, few spoke out, and that was a mistake. The Secretary General's mechanism was invoked, as we've seen just now, Inspectors reported that chemical weapons had been used and there was no significant action against Iraq, and that was a mistake. During the Cold War, Russia and the US built up their stocks of chemical weapons. The UK made a decision to abandon its offensive chemical weapons program in 1956 and worked hard from then on, along with many other countries, to eliminate chemical weapons entirely, which was done in 1993, and the Chemical Weapons Convention entered into force in 97. And almost every country in the world is a member of that treaty. Russia and the US have destroyed almost all of their stocks and they're on track for complete elimination within the next few years. The few countries that have not joined, that includes Israel but has not signed and not ratified, and Egypt and Syria that have never signed. And this treaty matters and it exists because chemical weapons are abhorrent. They're an inhumane way to kill and civilization demands that they be unusable and gone. And any entity that would use them by definition is not civilized and is inhumane. And doing nothing in the face of chemical weapons in Syria is not a civilized option. But in our response, we also have to be civilized. And so we need due process. <clears throat> now, Syria is a member of the, chem of the Geneva Protocol, the 1925 Geneva Protocol, and it has to be held to account. So after the accusations of low-level chemical use over the last few months in Syria, where each side has blamed the other, the UN inspectors were brought in to investigate. 
And despite months having passed, the investigation was still worth doing because chemicals persist in soil and in body tissue, and their breakdown products are well known and can be traced. And indeed, chemical signatures of sarin were found in contaminated soil from bomb craters in northern Iraq four years after the warplanes had dropped clusters of bombs there. The international team of UN inspectors were drawn from the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons and the World Health Organization. They've now collected and processed the samples, and they've sent to three certified laboratories around the world who are now conducting rigorous tests. The report will go to the Secretary General as soon as possible, and he will report to the UN Security Council. Now, what's interesting is the Security Council resolution of 1988, Resolution 620, which condemned the use of chemical weapons in the Iran-Iraq war and the violation of the 1925 protocol, um, sets out a decision by all the members of the Security Council to consider immediately appropriate and effective measures in accordance with the UN Charter should there be any future use of chemical weapons in violation of international law, wherever and by whomever committed. So states now do have to act immediately once those UN inspectors report. I think that's very important, because many countries are saying that they do not have to wait for the inspector's results, because they already know who committed the atrocity. And it is true that the inspectors are not mandated to discover who committed the atrocity, but what they find out will tell us quite a bit. We'll find out the composition of the gas. We'll find out its concentration. We'll find out whether it contained dispersal agents and stabilizing agents. And therefore, we should find out whether it's a gas made by a government force, a part of an improvised device. And the intelligence agencies of the US, UK, France, and Germany, and others may indeed be correct. But if we do not wait, they may not be believed. And that's important. 10 years ago, when inspectors went into Iraq to discover the WMD that the US and the UK went to war on, they soon discovered that the intelligence had been wrong on this matter. And this is hard to recover from. Once trust is broken, it takes a lifetime to reestablish it. And rushing now, will not, will be folly. Oh, I've got loads more to say. <laughs> we will have more questions and come back. Okay. I've just got some options. Can I just say a couple of options, please? Okay. We could get P5 unity if we wait, all right? Mr. Putin has said that he's prepared to consider force if it's proven. Um, we would, should involve the League of Arab States, and we should all provide all the intelligence we have to the Security Council. And I think as well that we could call a meeting of the Geneva Protocol in Geneva. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. Thank you. Alan. Thank you very much. Good evening. It's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to be addressing such an audience. At the outset, I've got to say, predicting the consequences of what look like imminent military strikes is fraught with difficulties. Just on Sunday, the International Crisis Group issued a statement warning to precisely gauge in advance the impact of a US military strike by definition is a fool's errand. Well, that's the errand I've got today. And I hope I can handle it in a way that's not too foolish. It would be hard enough to predict the consequences of an attack, even if one knew more about what it's going to be like, what its nature is. But what is meant by limited, narrow strikes, to use Obama's phrase? Will it just be the US that acts, or will France and Turkey also take part? Will their role also be limited? And what about Israel? What will the targets be, given that the declared intention will be to degrade the regime's ability to use chemical weapons? Theoretically, all Syria's airports could be targeted, thereby denying the regime not only the ability to deliver chemical weapons by air, but also the general dominance of the air that has been such a headache for the rebels. The consequences of the strikes will be molded by their nature, and the latter is simply unknown. In those circumstances, realistically, all that can be done in advance is to lay out a series of possible consequences, and in doing this, I'm assuming that the strikes really will be limited in scope. Okay, let's look at the possibilities. A really clever response by the Assad regime would be not to react at all. Since the start of this year, Israel has bombed Syria three times. In 2007, the Israelis bombed a Syrian alleged nuclear site. In 2006, they overflew Assad's palace in Damascus. And in 2003, they bombed a militant training camp near the Syrian capital. Damascus swore revenge, but did nothing. 
So no reaction really is a possibility. If the Assad regime decided to retaliate, it's unlikely to do it overtly and directly, in my view. On past form, the Syrian allied Hezbollah might fire missiles into Israel from Lebanon, albeit risking heavy retaliation in return. Westerners in Lebanon might be kidnapped by Syrian agents or Syria allied factions in a rerun of the 1980s hostage crisis. Another possibility could be a further use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime, assuming it was the regime that, that, that perpetrated the attacks, something I believe to be the case, believe. Such a response would be a political nightmare for Obama, given that the use of chemical weapons was supposedly a red line for Washington and that the strikes were intended to deter any repeat. Having insisted that the strikes were limited and narrow in scope, it would be difficult indeed for Obama to do nothing and equally difficult to take any further military action. There's been talk of some reaction from Iran. I discount that. I see no reason why Tehran would feel a need to become any more involved in Syria than it already is, although I wouldn't rule out uh, some covert Iranian involvement in retaliatory attacks against Western interests elsewhere. And what about the impact of the strikes for the Assad regime's security and stability? I see no reason at all why Damascus need be unduly troubled, assuming that the attacks really will be limited in scope and thus largely symbolic. There's been plenty of time to relocate military assets to safe locations. Assuming they really are narrowly focused, the strikes will not alter the fundamental balance of power between the regime and its opponents. Indeed, they could even provide political succor to the regime. Street-level anti-Western sentiment has been a constant in this region since the end of the First World War. The regime will have no difficulty pointing to the double standards at play, the West's support for a nuclear-armed Israel, bent on colonizing the occupied Palestinian lands, and so on. President Obama, politically wounded since the outset of his administration by his inability to secure any Israeli concessions on Palestine, speaks of the need to protect America's credibility. But the reality amongst the Syrian public is that the US had no credibility to start with. The reality is that the strikes could play straight into the regime's narrative, that it is an anti-imperialist bastion fighting an international terrorist conspiracy. It's a narrative as intellectually dishonest as the West's equivalent, the war on terrorism, but it has considerable support within Syria. Opponents of military action, not least in the UK Parliament, have asserted that military strikes could discourage the Assad regime from engaging in negotiations with its opponents domestically. Supporters of the strikes argue the precise opposite. I have to say that both demonstrate a misunderstanding of the very nature of this regime. It is just not in the business of concession and negotiation. It never has been. It's just not that sort of animal. In my view, military action will have no effect one way or the other on the prospects for a negotiated settlement of this conflict. My last two points leave a profound question hanging in the air. If narrow, limited strikes are unlikely to achieve anything, is there any point to them? Thank you. And, uh, and uh, Sir Malcolm Rifkind. The decision by the House of Commons, unexpected decision by the House of Commons to uh, reject the government's proposal uh, has obviously resulted in a great deal of angst and concern as to the implications for the United Kingdom and its foreign policy and its relationship with the United States. There's already been reference to the fact that the United States president uh, referred to France as the United States' oldest ally. Well, I don't think we should be too worried about that. <laughs> it is indeed the case that France is the oldest ally because they helped the United States defeat the United Kingdom during the War of Independence. So it's hardly likely we could have ever had that particular title. It's worth thinking as to why what happened in the House of Commons did happen. And it would be a mistake to believe there was one single reason. A significant number of members of Parliament of all parties were opposed to a response regardless of the evidence, even if the evidence was overwhelming that the Assad, which I have to think it is, but even if they accepted that it was overwhelming that the Assad regime were responsible for these chemical attacks, they just believe, for some of the reasons that have been mentioned just now, that it would be counterproductive and wrong to respond in the way it recommended. But that was not the position 
of the official opposition. And I sat opposite Ed Miliband in the chamber. And he said not once, not twice, but four times, I think it was, in his opening remarks, that the Labour Party, the official opposition, could support a military response out with the Security Council if certain conditions were met. And it's because of the extraordinary similarity between the opposition amendment and the government proposal uh, that there has been such confusion as to what it might mean uh, for a longer-term United Kingdom uh, policy. I don't think this is a dramatic sea change in the attitude either of Parliament or of the British people. A few months ago, I spoke in the Oxford Union on the 80th anniversary uh, of the famous or notorious motion that this House would not fight for king and country. Uh, when that motion was passed in 1933, it is recorded that Mussolini assumed the British were decadent and Hitler concluded that they would never fight. Uh, and, of course, history judged uh, otherwise. Let me go to the heart of the issues that have been raised uh, this evening. Of course, much of the concern arises from Iraq. I was strongly against the Iraq war. I think it was a very foolish mistake. But it needs to be repeated again and again. What's being contemplated at the moment bears not the slightest resemblance. Saddam Hussein didn't have nuclear weapons. And even if he had been planning them, they were certainly nowhere near possessing them or using them. The Syrian government admit to massing stocks of chemical weapons. And the only issue for which some people still want further evidence is whether they were responsible for an attack that we now understand killed up to 1,400 men, women, and children. Now, if there is a military response, there is a purpose behind it. It is not simply to punish the Syrian government, punishment though they may very much deserve. It's much simpler than that. It is how else does anyone think they are going to be deterred from doing it again and again and again? in increasing amounts. They have these stocks. They have no ethical objection to them, no regime that's already slaughtered tens of thousands of its own citizens by random artillery attacks and bombing is, has any compunction about doing it if they think they can get away with it. There is evidence that they've used it on small amounts over the last few months. And they would conclude that they had got away with it. Let us assume that there is no military intervention over the next few weeks. Do we genuinely believe, does anyone remotely think, that Assad and his colleagues, wherever they think there is a military rationale, and the military rationale a week or so ago was there. They were trying to recapture a suburb of Damascus that was controlled by the opposition. It was proving much more difficult than they'd anticipated. And by using chemical weapons, which indiscriminately remove all live human beings from the scene, that gave them a significant tactical military advantage. And since then, they've been waiting to see, have we got away with it? And if they conclude they have got away with it, then it will be repeated. Now, I can't guarantee, nobody can guarantee that uh, a military strike over the next few days to seek to deter them will succeed. Of course, we can't be sure of that. But there's one thing we can be sure of, that without any military response, uh, then they certainly will continue that behavior. Let me just say a word about the United Nations. Because anyone who has any sense believes in the desirability of the Security Council being the forum which determines matters of military activity. But let's not turn that into an unalterable icon. And let me quote in support of what I am saying. Not some uh, uh, American neocon. Nye Bevan. Idol of the Labour Party, once said he was, could be a very wise man. He said, if there's one thing I detest more than my country, right or wrong, it is the United Nations, right or wrong. And what he meant was that, of course, the United Nations doesn't have a corporate identity. It can be prevented from acting by one country using its veto. And you cannot use that as the means which prevent any attempt by the international community to respond in a meaningful way. Before the Second World War, we had the League of Nations. It was destroyed because of the ability of Germany and Italy, in various ways, to thwart its use. And we know what that led to. So I conclude in the very short introduction we're all making, simply saying this. I don't pretend that these things are straightforward. I don't know any more than anyone else here exactly how the Assad regime will respond. 
But I do know that a few weeks and months, they probably were responsible for killing a few dozen people. And then it became 100 or so. And last week it was 1,400. And what happens if we don't respond, and in a month's time it's 5,000 or 10,000? That's the ethical question, not just the political question. We all have to ponder. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much indeed, firstly for the substance, but also everyone for keeping to within time. One issue, I'm just going to use Chair's prerogative here, just as no one has touched on it, the legal context. We've heard quite a lot about the evidentiary basis and the political and geopolitical aspects. The legal context is, in a sense, relatively straightforward. The framework is you've got two classical justifications in international law, self-defense, no one argues it's self-defense, and authorization by the Security Council. No one argues there's an authorization of the Security Council. It leaves a possible third emergent justification under international law, which is classically known as humanitarian intervention. To put my cards on the table, I'm a supporter of humanitarian intervention, provided that the conditions are met. And I'm extremely grateful to all our speakers for having honed in, really, on the central issue. It's an evidentiary issue, from a legal perspective, on two questions. One, are we persuaded that the Assad regime is the source of the attack? And secondly, are we persuaded that a proportionate use of force would prevent further attacks? Those, in essence, are the two questions a lawyer would look at, such as me, in relation to these two issues. Now, over to the floor. I would ask, please, that you introduce yourselves uh, by name and by affiliation, and I would beg you to keep your questions short, not public statements. Uh, and I'm going to take three questions in a row to maximize the opportunity to all uh, of, of our speakers. Please. Thank you. Jane Kinnanmont from the Middle East program here at Chatham House. Can we separate this debate on chemical weapons and deterrence from the broader context of Western policy towards Syria? Does it make sense to speak about it in isolation from a broader agenda that does say the Assad regime should be changed and that supports the opposition in a whole variety of ways. Thank you. Right, thank you. And of course, I'm just coming from Washington, I'm acutely aware that President Obama is beginning to have to make concessions in relation to that very issue in order to get a vote. Um, gentlemen here in the front. Uh, there is some evidence. So could, you, could you please uh, introduce yourself? Stuart, Stuart Wheeler of UKIP. There is some evidence that it may have been the rebels and not the Assad regime that did this. If that were to turn out right, should there be any bombing? And if so, who and what should be bombed? And then um, I'll come to another side of the room. And lady, lady over there. Um, my name is Sandra Kuduri. I'm a communications advisor. Um, just regarding Iran and Russia, how possible is it going to be to find any common ground with them, to find a sort of joint approach to a solution and, and pass, perhaps push for negotiation? Is, is it possible to find common ground with them? It seems only a joint approach will work. Right. You, you wanted to come straight in, um, uh, on, I think, on the first question or the second question. Well, quite rightly, you made us stick to our time, so I'll continue where I was going to <laughs> <laughs> briefly. <laughs> I was going to say this is part of a much... That question's hanging in the air. Uh, are, are the strikes worthwhile at all. I was going to go on to say this is part of a much wider question about Western intervention in Syria generally. I would say the West missed its chance to intervene effectively in about August, September of 2011. As a result of the non-intervention, uh, there was a political military vacuum was created, which was filled by uh, Islamists of one sort or another for all sorts of very good reasons. Um, certainly, uh, large elements of the Syrian opposition are antagonistic both to the West and to democracy and human rights. And they're very likely to play a central role in whatever Syria emerges from this mess. I still think there's a, the West has an opportunity, uh, has, a, has a, some scope for influencing uh, events in Syria. Not much appetite for it, but some scope. It has to be a sustained, meaningful program uh, assistance, including military assistance, to, if you like, selected parts of the opposition. 
I, I say that with great caution. I feel so strongly that the, the real chance was missed, and, and it's now much more messy than it might have been. Can I ask um, Malcolm perhaps to take the, the, the second question on the what-if scenario? And can I tweak it slightly? What if we never find out definitively, but, but, but that following a military attack, there is then a further use of chemical weapons which is attributed to a different group? The question of Syrian Assad regime responsibility is not speculative. First of all, it is not in dispute that the Syrian government themselves don't deny that they have chemical weapons, very large stocks of very sophisticated chemical weapons. That's the first point. Nobody else in Syria that we know has these. The intelligence reports could be wrong, but there is no intelligence evidence that any significant uh, chemical stocks are possessed by any of the rebel uh, groups. That's the first point. Secondly, the attack happened when the Assad regime's forces were actually themselves had had several days of artillery barrage in the very suburb where the chemical weapons were used. That's the second point. Thirdly, look at the scale of these attacks. If, and this is where the inspectors could indeed be relevant, if you had a dozen people killed, yes, then it is possible you could have some do-it-yourself bag of chemical agent as happened in the Tokyo underground a good number of years ago. But forget what politicians are saying. Medicine Sans Frontieres, operating within the very part of Damascus, say they treated 3,000 3,000 people affected by what they believe was this chemical weapons attack. Some, uh, over a week ago, they thought 300 had died. The Americans are saying they think it's now 1,400, probably, of that same 3,000. Now, that requires not just having chemical weapons. It requires the uh, rockets, the artillery, the actual infrastructure that can deliver that degree, that substance of attack. Nobody else in Syria has that. None of the intelligence agencies have any reason. In fact, they've said quite explicitly, uh, we believe no one else has anything remotely like that. The Syrian government does have it. It happened in an opposition-controlled area. Do we really believe there's much but, left but, to but, prove? But, but take it, I, I, I hear all of that. But take it walks it, like a duck but, and it looks but, like a but, duck. But, it's a duck. But what if? <laughs> but, what, but what if? But what if a, a, an outside look, force contributed? Look, I, what, I, what if? Look, you know, think of it like uh, somebody charged... Uh, 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 prosecuted for murder in our courts. The, the, the burden of proof is not uh, uh, you can only convict him if somebody actually saw him pulling the trigger. The burden of proof, as you know, <laughs> as well as most, is the burden is, is beyond reasonable doubt. I'm not going to speculate on absurd theoretical, hypothetical possibilities where there's not there an iota of evidence that points in that direction. Okay, beyond that, reasonable doubt, by God, it's there. That, that's a clear view. You, you wanted to address the Russian. Uh, I do, and but I wanted to also to address this because what's the rush? Why this rush? Why not wait for the inspectors? That would be like saying, I, I with in, with, if it were a murder and waiting for. I agree, we can't see who pointed the gun, but we would let the police do their job. They may not find out everything either. So um, my concern is that if we we're going to rush and do this before. Um, the inspectors have time to report, then we lay ourselves wide open to all no. sorts of problems. Just a brief point on that. I broadly agree with you. I mean, the inspectors have said it could take them three weeks to produce every single answer to every single question. I think the only one that's actually relevant is, are they satisfied as to the scale of the use of chemical weapons uh, that 3,000 people, as Medicine Sans Frontier have said, uh, seem to have been affected by this, with perhaps up to 1,500 dying. If they can confirm that, that is, I think, the crucial thing, and they should be able to do that pretty quickly. So I to to yes, I wanted to address the issue of Iran and Russia. So President Putin has said that he would be prepared to agree, if it was pr proved beyond doubt, that the Syrian government had used chemical weapons. And I'm detecting uh, a, a shift in, in his stance. Um, and so I think it is worth, and it is, it's quite a prize. If um, President Obama, um, Prime Minister Cameron and others were able to secure Russian support, it would be a fantastic prize that would have much longer consequences and would make us all a lot better off throughout the whole world. And the Arab League, presumably. The Arab League is, has, has a strong view on this already um, in, in, a, in a way in which they're very concerned about the use of chemical uh, weapons. I can assume that at this very moment in St. Petersburg, the, the, the Obama, Cameron, Hollande are saying to Putin, 
do you mean it when you say you'd be able to support if the right. evidence is there? And on Iran, I think Baroness Williams' proposal to engage Iran is a really interesting idea. Um, of all countries in the world, Iran knows what it's like to be attacked by chemical weapons, and they have um, medical staff, health workers, who are expert in this, and they should go and, and assist. And in fact, I think some of them have already. J James. Thank you. Uh, James Stewart, I think the common denominator from your questions is, uh, echoing your own point there, is uh, a problem with why rush to action now. It's been 12 months since the President's uh, red line remarks. There have been multiple reports of multiple actions since then. And I think, uh, addressing them very, very briefly, can we separate the, the weaponry from a, a wider agenda to Syria? I think we can, and I think we see elements of that within the Obama's confused policy. It doesn't seem to know whether what it's doing is trying to dismantle and dissuade Ob uh, Syria from doing this again, or whether there is regime change uh, in, in the hidden element of the policy. And I think that's going to come to the fore and perhaps split... Up By the rush, there has been a well, new development. Is, there has been... Uh, something has happened that is terrible. Oh, it's possible, but there's also been reports that uh, incidents like this have occurred uh, in the last 12 months. Clearly, it's on a, a bigger scale. I wonder whether it has to do, for example, with a shift in administration uh, uh, personnel, for example. Um, and again, uh, Stuart, your point, I think that would be well addressed as well. There's no great rush to try and decide this today. I think the Prime Minister was perhaps ill-advised to rush uh, and reconvene Parliament as it did. Congress is clearly going to take uh, at least a week or two now, we're hearing from Pelosi, to debate this. And I think that one of the problems you're seeing uh, is, uh, whilst I, I don't subscribe to the, the point of view that I know members of UKIP have raised, that they could be the rebels, I'm more inclined to agree with, with Sir Malcolm on this, but uh, the West's position will be greatly strengthened if we could wait and confirm that. Um, I'm not convinced, I don't think, Sandra, that uh, Iran and Russia really are going to come round to uh, an embrace of the West, but uh, I think there are promising signs and, and messages coming out of Tehran in particular. Uh, I don't think that Putin really is going to come around and, uh, uh, and, and embrace the West, but I think he would be hard placed to continue uh, such a, a fervent support of uh, Assad if it was proven that the regime in, uh, in Damascus was responsible, and I think that ultimately will, will come out. Okay, let's have a second round of three questions. I'm going to go across the room. The gentleman on the right over here, the lady in the front over here, and the gentleman in the third section over there, and then I'll, we will have an, another round of questions, so, but the gentleman at the back over there, thirdly. Jimmy Yusser, member of Chatham House and also a uh, solicitor here in London. I totally disagree with you, uh, Sir Malcolm, because you distorted the fact, and this is not Houses of Parliament here, because you are uh, obviously hawkish, which I accept that, but are you aware, or have you got the knowledge, in Turkey, it's near a uh, Syrian border, the province is called Adana, 12 kilos of sarin were found by the Turkish police on Syrian so-called rebels, I call them murderers. And also your analysis of uh, murder. As a defense lawyer myself, again, I disagree with you. The burden is on the CPS to prove beyond reasonable doubt the defendant doesn't have to do anything. Okay. Thank you. Okay. No, um, we're gonna, there's a lady behind. We'll, we'll have another round we'll, uh, over here. And if you could introduce yourself, and then the gentleman over there, and then we'll have answers, and then we'll have another round. Uh, Ellen Darendorf, member of Chatham House. My question is about unintended consequences. One hears very much these days that um, an American military strike could lead to conflagration in the Middle East, which is in no one's interest, not in Russia's or Iran. How no one can know, but I wonder what the panel feels about that. Okay. And then the gentleman, Michael Burton, um, member of Chatham House and a former director for the Middle East and the Foreign Office. My question is mainly for Sir Malcolm Rifkind, uh, as a prominent supporter of military intervention, which is a position which I happen to agree with. Uh, and the question is, if it takes place, how will you judge that it has been a success rather than a failure, that it has done more good than harm? What boxes in your own mind needed to, need to be ticked off before it can be judged to have been a good thing? It's a very interesting question. I was uh, in the plane coming over reading the article in Prospect magazine uh, on the successes and in the of that case, the failures uh, of um, 
of the policy in Afghanistan and what are the criteria. And then on the back pages, on the sports pages, I read Greg Dyke's analysis of how we judge the success of his chairmanship of the Football Association, and it is Britain, win England, winning the, football, the World Cup in 2022. So the question of how, what are the criteria, is an absolutely crucial question. Let's start this time at this end um, uh, with you, James, to take your pick of those questions. Which question? Which hey, one um, question do you want to answer? I, I'm going to address Ellen's point, if I may, about unintended consequences. I honestly believe that this is a major reason why the Obama administration is prevaricating the way it is. There's no doubt about it, Barack Obama did not seek the White House uh, to widen American involvement in the world. He has, over the last five years, uh, withdrawn from Iraq and Afghanistan. And I think, as I was trying to make clear in my, point, in, in my points, uh, inadvertently perhaps uh, with this red line remark, uh, put himself into a corner, which he and his uh, colleagues have been trying ever since to get out of. Uh, I believe if you look at who's driving this theory and this policy forward, it's his underlings, it's John Kerry and Samantha Power, who I think have got their own agendas at stake here. And I think the president has tried to walk this back. And he's so doing, if you think about his remarks in the Rose Garden uh, over the weekend when he decided to move this into Congress, I think it's a very smart, if not cynical, move by the president to try to say, well, I'm going to take the moral high ground. I'm going to stay here and say, I'm commander in chief. And I always have an issue with powerful people who, just, who sit there and say, by the way, I am president. I am the most powerful person. I think that should go without saying, frankly. Um, but that by then kicking it into Congress, where he knows that he has a very poor record of getting them to agree to anything, quite frankly, uh, since the, uh, uh, the midterm elections of 2010, for example. Uh, Republicans control uh, the lower house. Uh, the Senate might be in Democrat control, but as I pointed out, they don't have a supermajority. So I believe that this is a, a cynical manipulation, but one which is designed by Obama to try to say, look, uh, I would like to go in, I'm commander in chief, uh, but those wily Republicans aren't going to let me do it. Aren't they a bunch of, uh, uh, of isolationists and tea partiers? Uh, and with a view to uh, maximizing political gain in 2014 and ultimately 2016, uh, because he does not believe in uh, this idea of wanting to uh, exacerbate a wider war in the Middle East. Question about the 12 kilos of sarin. Again, if I can tweak that slightly and uh, invite Patricia to comment, because obviously it's a technical question. Is it technically possible? for a Red Bull group to put together something that would cause the kind of mayhem that has been described in the reports that we've been... Well, uh, we've been as, as Malcolm said, uh, you know, a, sm a group can produce a small amount of sarin. It's, it's, it's basically a, an insecticide. It's based on uh, an organophosphorus compound. Um, and uh, we saw that in Tokyo in, in, in use. Uh, certainly there have been a lot of rumours about uh, amounts of stocks being supplied by other regional countries. Um, there have been rumors that, uh, you know, we can see from the uh, rockets that these were improvised devices. And I think because of all these rumors, this is why we need the UN's report, so that those things are either laid to rest. Can the UN report definitively settle that? These I, th kinds of questions? I think the evidence will, uh, will be much stronger um, one way or the other. It will be made much clearer to us as to what type of chemical this is. The numbers... The numbers, though, point to a massive use of a government stock. That's so what, the would, problem. what should we, the non-technical people, be looking for in the reports that are going to emerge shortly? Um, the amount, uh, the amount used, uh, the whether or not it contained things like stabilizers, dispersal agents, which are quite sophisticated, Malcolm mentioned, sophisticated type of weapons. And that would tend to point. That would definitely that would that would definitely point to government stocks. Which government? We can argue about. Right. It looks okay. likely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm now. About you which other government, government you had in mind? <laughs> I, I just, you know, I keep my options open. <laughs> <laughs> no, on, on, on the two points, uh, a brief comment, if I may. First of all, I, I obviously agree with what's just been said about it depends on the scale of usage. Uh, you know, what happened in Tokyo was in the underground, by definition, a confined space, where even then, I, what was it, 100 people died or something like, like that? I'm not sure. No. How many? Thirteen. In, in, Thirty people, right. Now, here we're talking about somewhere between 300 and 1,400 uh, and 3,000 people affected. Uh, and in an open space, you know, that can't just be done by somebody coming along and uh, making mischief. Th th this required... Uh, I won't go through it again. You've heard the arguments. Uh, on the, the, the question I was asked by Michael Burton, what would be the test of success? A very easy question to answer if they don't do it again. Simple as that. 
if there is no further use of chemical weapons. That's the only justification for what is being recommended at the moment, is to deter or seek to deter Assad and his people from using chemical weapons again. That, that is surely a tremendous hostage to fortune, is it not? Well, I'm sorry. That, that can be, that, if that is why you're doing it, that can be the only test as to whether you've succeeded. Right. So it and if you don't succeed, if they do chemi use chemical weapons again, then that will be a challenge, not just for the people in this room, but for the Russian government and for others who share the view that nothing must be done. They will have to ask themselves, how long will that continue at ever-increasing amounts? Because as Assad slowly loses this war, which he's likely to do over the next year or so, he will use any means available to him if he thinks he can get away with it without being punished for that. That is what's going to happen. And we will be sitting here in a year's time, but the number of people who will have been the victims of chemical weapons will be very, very much greater if nothing is done to stop them. Uh, Alan, I have to say I agree totally. I, I mentioned the nature of this regime, and you really have to understand the nature. This regime is fighting for its survival. It's always based its uh, existence on terrorizing its own people, on violence. It's never had a popular mandate. Uh, it knows what the consequences of losing this conflict is going to be, uh, and it will do anything and use any method to survive in some form or other. But, but uh, that needs that to be understood. Raise the question. I mean, M Malcolm's benchmark for success assumes rationality in the decision-making process that points to the kind of outcome we might go towards. But you're saying that is not the decision-making process of this regime. Uh, it remains to be seen how they'll respond. In my talk, I said there is a possibility that they will do it again. And I, I think that's right. You then have to deal with that set of circumstances. Of course, and then do that. Because what is sad, it's not that he will be impressed that he's been punished, period. It is what he's terrified of is the international community using military means uh, to, get, to, to get rid of him. To get rid of him. You know, right. no-fly zones, the various other means that are available that he saw right. brought down Gaddafi and so forth. That's what he's terrified of, because he knows right. that if that did happen... But, but that points then directly what you're saying, in effect, is escalation is built into this. It's like all deterrence. You know, during the whole of the Cold War, nuclear weapons were not thought by any sane person to be a, a war-fighting system. It was to deter by creating the belief that if you create aggression, you will be punished. And, and, if, and if that requires boots on the ground eventually? Well, th then we've all failed. Then we've all failed. Because the objective of deterrence is not to have to carry out your threat. But if you do have to carry it out, to be willing to do so. Right, but you're, you're saying deterrence is not... Uh, well, we've, not we've, certain. We've, I would like to, to just <laughs> respond to the question of a regional conflagration. I, that's already happening, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, Lebanon is on the brink... Uh, Iraq is worse than it has been for a while. Um, I, I don't think whether or not there are strikes next week is actually going to change that reality, sadly. It's very depressing. But Patricia, you wanted to come yeah. in just very quickly. I wanted we'll to come in round. on the issue of unintended consequences and, and say that um, you know, one of the big problems with this is that uh, in a conflict, in a, in a time of war, people do not think necessarily logically or rationally. I mean, President Putin keeps saying, why would Assad have used these things? Because it's not logical that he would use them. You know, the inspectors that come in, they use them the day after. Uh, why would he do it when he would then uh, incur the wrath of everybody? But the truth is that we don't act logically. We don't act rationally. We act very emotionally in times like this. And so we have to factor in that emotion, and it could well spiral out of control. I think that David Cameron's call uh, for reinvigorating the peace process is one of the most sensible things I've heard uh, in the last few days. Uh, we have a, a crisis. We can always use a crisis as an opportunity. Uh, we've let that go for the last year, and I think it's time that we look at that again, uh, perhaps forcing uh, people's minds because of, of, of the possibility of military action. Okay, we have 10 minutes left. We've got time for three more questions. I'm going to go all the way to the back of the room to give those who are sitting at the back a chance. Gentlemen, all the way over there, followed by the, is it, yeah, the lady in the far right over there in the stripy shirt, and then the gentleman here on this side in front. Marcus Worry, uh, I run uh, the Real Debate Club, amongst other things. Um, I'm interested, we, we've heard a bit about the US 
situation and I, um, with regards to the, the politics of it. And I wonder about the situation in the UK. So I'm specifically interested in whether Ed Miliband's reaction to this was opportunistic or genuine. And on the matter as a whole, the issue of going to Parliament, as opposed to what we know happened under, under Blair and at various times in the, in the past, um, that seems to be the, the, the big issue here. And whether, it sh whether, the, whether an issue such as this, going back to Ed Miliband and his thing, whether it should be party political, whether it should have been a free vote. If we're talking about democracy, should it have been a free vote? Or if we really want to get truly democratic, should, it have been a di should, it, should we have gone direct to the public? Um, sorry, I've read a few things there, but I, I hope yeah. you so, can decide so to something. The position of the UK, I, say, I, I listened to the debate. I was in Maine driving from Bar Harbor to Bangor Airport to drop my daughter at the bus station when I listened to Jack Straw. And the thought that I had, because it was a very curious speech that he made, was he must have received a Maxwellization letter under the Chilcot inquiry because his tone was so completely different uh, from that which we have heard on previous occasions that I think your question inscribes itself in the context that we have lived in this country in the last 10 years. But panellists will, will react to that. Lady on the right. Um, Emily Riley, humanitarian working on Syria. Uh, what are the peaceful, punitive alternatives and does any of the panel advocate them? Thank you. And then this gentleman here. My name is Nisar Ali Shah. I'm a journalist by profession. I profoundly disagree with Malcolm, uh, uh, Malcolm Rifkin. Uh, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 I actually knew the name. Uh, Rifkin. I've, I've been following his speeches for a long time, actually. I'm old enough to know him. But uh, the West Alliance Malcolm. should be very careful. Malcolm. The West Alliance should be very careful because Syria possesses the modern weapons supplied by Russia. They have got anti-aircraft uh, uh, missiles, which can travel 260 kilometers. And uh, Syria has weapons that Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya didn't have. So the West, actually, if you are thinking a limited uh, action, it will not work. The Senate, hold, the Senate panel of the Foreign Relations Committee suggested 60 days bombing and no troops on this Syrian soil, and no body bags coming to America. This will not happen. So my putting warning is that if a Russian aeroplane is brought down by the can Americans, I, I, I think, then, I think, I think we've then got, we've there will be a... We've only, got, we've only got eight minutes left. Okay, yeah. so can I... I think we've understood the question. My question is that would this limited military attack on Syria will work and how the consequences okay. will be, because nobody eight, answered that. We have they talk eight, about we consequences, have, we have, we they have don't eight, answer We it. have eight minutes left. We've got four speakers. In reverse order, you can take your pick, our wonderful four speakers on the issues that have been raised, but you have only two minutes. Malcolm. Okay. Rifkind, uh, not uh, Malcolm Smith of Croydon. <laughs> uh, I'll deal with the, the Miliband uh, question mid, uh, earlier. Uh, I, I think what was extraordinary about what happened, uh, it seems that on Tuesday of last week, uh, the government and the opposition appeared to be agreeing with each other. Uh, Cameron, I, I wasn't present obviously, but Cameron had discussions with Miliband, and I think that that is a correct report because we know that the opposition amendment was actually very similar to the government amendment uh, that eventually was before the House of Commons. Miliband decided nevertheless to vote against the government's amendment. To be honest, I don't think he thought he was going to win. Uh, I think he was under pressure because of people in his own party who disagreed with any kind of support for intervention. And also, he takes the view, and it's not an unreasonable view, the job of the opposition is to oppose the government. It's not simply to give them comfort. Okay, that's fine. What I would have hoped would have happened is that given the consequences of the vote, which has certainly damaged the United Kingdom internationally, but it's also damaged Miliband internationally, because he hopes to be prime minister one day. And I would have thought throughout Washington, and in President Hollande, and Angela Merkel, they're all saying, well, this guy looks as if there's a sort of party political dimension here when we're talking about foreign policy. Now, that may be an unfair accusation, but that, that is the problem he has to deal with. So what I'd, I hope would happen, will happen still, is that 
uh, Miliband and Cameron will have a private meeting, identify how much common ground they have. And if there is enough common ground, that's the one thing that could justify a return to Parliament for another debate and an opportunity for another vote. Do I think it's going to happen? No, I don't, actually. Should it happen? Yes, it ought to. Uh, Alan. Um, on the question of peaceful, punitive alternatives, um, you know, well over 100,000 people have been killed. Uh, there are 2 million refugees outside Syria, 4 million displaced within Syria. Tens of thousands have been incarcerated and tortured by this regime. Chemical weapons, I believe, are being used, have been used. Uh, again, I come back to the type of animal this regime is. Uh, it's not uh, susceptible to, to, to non-punitive measures. So the answer, I fear, is sadly there are no alternatives. On the weapons, it's quite interesting, actually. One of the major reasons given in the West for not intervening militarily in 2011 was the fantastic air defences that Syria had. But you don't actually hear anything about that these days at all. Um, and I mentioned the various Israeli attacks, uh, which were carried out without any loss of aircraft. Uh, military contacts tell me that swift, sudden attacks uh, can get through in Syria. Possibly a longer-term sustained campaign might be more uh, susceptible to Syrian countermeasures. Patricia. Right. Well, I, I'll, I'll also approach the alternatives. And I think that um, I mentioned reinvigorating the, pe the peace talks, and I think that's the most important thing. One possibility as well is that the UN Security Council to uh, refer this to the International Criminal Court. This is a crime. Whoever carried it out, it is a crime, and, and it should be t uh, treated as such. I would also um, ask the states parties of the Chemical Weapons Convention, even though Syria is not a member, to call an emergency meeting to discuss and to be seen to discuss and to actually do something uh, to reinvigorate that regime. And also, as I mentioned, the Geneva Protocol, high contracting parties. The other thing, though, I think, is to think about responsibility to protect it about being just more than military action. Um, the refugees, are we all giving enough money to the aid agencies, to the UNICEF, um, uh, to UNHCR, etc.? Um, are we supplying gas masks to the Syrian citizens right now? Uh, are, are shiploads of those coming in? Um, are we supplying uh, medical supplies? All of those things I think we could do right now with no impact on all of the other political debates. Jane. Thank you. Um, let me address the first question. Uh, I, I can't read Ed Miliband's mind. Uh, I presume he's thinking, um, but that's a, that's a guess. Um, but I, I believe the Prime Minister did the right thing for democracy by going to Parliament, and uh, he's been referred, he referred to himself as the heir to Blair, and I think he was trying very hard not to be seen in that light with regards to Syria, with the obvious uh, parallel with Iraq. Um, it's very easy to criticise Ed Miliband, and, uh, and I have in the past. I guess I will in the future. Um, his job is to oppose, uh, but the job of the government is also presumably to whip support. And I think that if you look at the numbers involved, I think if a better whipping operation had been put in place by the government, we'd be talking about a very, very different animal today. Uh, it's, it's very concerning uh, when uh, key members of the, the government uh, weren't uh, in the chamber. Some of them who were claimed not to have heard the division bell. Uh, I, I, I wonder about the logistics of that personally. Um, but uh, no doubt about it, I think if the Prime Minister's come out of this slightly wounded, then uh, as Sir Malcolm rightly said, uh, there's no doubt that Ed Miliband, I think, has come out of this severely wounded, uh, certainly on, Wash on Capitol Hill. You may have seen something that uh, I believe it was the Telegraph or the Times repeated. I'm not going to repeat it. Uh, some of the language that Number 10 and uh, the, F the FO came out with uh, with regard to Ed Miliband. Uh, and if they think he's a... Uh, I dread to think what the White House thinks. Well... We have, unfortunately, run out of time, um, and I'm going to begin by thanking the wonderful audience for uh, its size of, of, of attendance, but also the really excellent questions which have contributed to a fabulous panel discussion. I have to say, I, I, what I might, I'm really curious to know what the totality of the audience feels about the way forward, and I'm just wondering whether it breaches some Chatham House rule to see whether, by a show of hands, if you found yourself... And I'm, being told it's not a problem, but I'm just, I have no idea what the result would be. If you found yourselves now in Parliament, in the British Parliament or in, 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 in the US Senate, having to vote in favour of a motion to 
um, use a limited military force to uh, achieve the aims that um, Malcolm has put to us, how would you vote? I, I, and I'm wondering whether I, could, I feel able to put that to you. Let me ask you then. Okay, let's have a show of hands. Who would, who would vote in favor of the kind of restrictive use of force that Sir Malcolm Rifkin uh, has now um, proposed is appropriate? Free or post-chemical report? Yeah. Yeah. Let's say, say post-chemical report, because I think there's a broad consensus that it really ought to... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let, 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 let's assume that the chemical report tends to support the view uh, that it, it was a use by the regime. Post-chemical and no UN Security, and no UN Security <laughs> Council. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is Chatham House. So post-UN post report, tending to show, but not absolutely conclusive, <laughs> and no Security Council resolution. Who would support the use of force essentially for humanitarian intervention purposes? Well, uh, uh, okay, and who would, uh, who would abstain? Uh, yep, who would not vote? You have that right. Who would not hear the division bell? And who would vote against? I'd say it's a tiny majority for the use of force in those circumstances. Yeah, no, four, well, no, four. Four, four, tiny, a small majority, I would say. Well, look, I mean, that, I'm so sorry to put you in that position, but I'm most interested and very grateful. Thank you very much, all of you, and thank you to this wonderful panel. <laughs>